Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Breaking down news of the day, my contributor, none other than Benny Carollo, who is also breakdown contributor, host of Bleep Blop, Ben and Superstar on Twitch as well. Should be a fascinating breakdown. Top story of the day, Joe Biden actually has an option to eliminate this back and forth with Republicans who are operating in bad faith in reference to our debt ceiling. Now remember, if the debt ceiling is not either A, extended or somehow ignored, which I'm going to get into in just a moment, that means a lot of people won't get paid, but they will still be required to work. You see, the federal government is the number one employer of black Americans. A lot of people did not know that, it is true. And many of them are working basically check to check in many circumstances. There are two ways you can eliminate this argument in the future. Number one, when they don't get paid, Congress does not get paid. That's one way to do it. I guarantee if you connect this issue of the debt ceiling to the actual pay of Congress 100% of the time, no exceptions, you get a different outcome. That's likely never going to happen. But there is something else that Biden has as a legitimate move in order to make sure millions of Americans are not disenfranchised because of the politics of conservatives. Here it is. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy emerged from his office after what he said was a productive phone call with President Biden. The agreement would be, let's get our teams back together so everybody clearly understands what we're talking about, what they're talking about. Biden called McCarthy from Air Force One en route to Washington from the G7 summit in Japan, cutting short his overseas trip to address the crisis. McCarthy welcomed the chance to re-engage face to face. The president said he's already addressed deficit concerns at the heart of the stalemate. I've done my part. We put forward a proposal to cut spending by more than a trillion dollars. And on top of the nearly $3 trillion in deficit reduction that I previously proposed through the combination of spending cuts and new revenues. House Republicans want spending cuts beyond what Biden has proposed. Two other priorities, recover billions in unspent COVID relief funds and impose work requirements for Medicaid and food stamp recipients. I believe if you're an able-bodied man, you ought to be working. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the deadline to avoid default remains June 1st. But today, some Republican lawmakers suggested the government can hold out until mid-June. Yellen says not so. The odds of reaching June 15th while being able to pay all of our bills is quite low. Some Democrats have urged Biden to avoid default, even if Congress does not raise a debt ceiling by invoking the 14th Amendment, which states the nation's debt should not be questioned. Look, my, my view is the president should use all legal options out there. I think that is a legal option. It is a legal option, completely within the context of law, based on the Constitution. There is a conflict. I will explain the conflict in just a moment. Here's one of the biggest problems with this negotiation. And they are going to continue, Mr. President, to move the goalpost every time there's a perceived agreement. The reason is because you're not actually negotiating with Speaker McCarthy. You're negotiating with these two, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates. Yep, that's who you are actually negotiating with because those individuals, they have this level of control over McCarthy and frankly Republicans and they're not loosening grip. Progressive lawmakers renewed their call for President Joe Biden to bypass Congress to avert a default after the abrupt cancellation of debt ceiling talks on Friday. But the White House remains resistant. It issued a subdued statement indicating it sees no reason to pull the plug on talks. Senior Biden officials have told progressive activists and lawmakers in recent days that they do not see the 14th Amendment, which says the validity of the public debt cannot be questioned as a viable means of circumventing the debt ceiling negotiations. They have argued that doing so would be risky and destabilizing, according to three people familiar. But the discussions, there's more. The White House 
has studied the issue for months. Some with some aides concluding that Biden would likely have the authority to declare the debt limit unconstitutional as a last ditch way to sidestep default. But Biden advisors have told progressives that they see it as a poor option overall. Fearing such a move would trigger a pitched legal battle, undermine global faith in US credit worthiness and damage the economy. Officials have warned that even the appearance of more seriously considering the 14th Amendment could blow up talks that are already quite delicate. They have not rooted out, said one advisor to the White House, granted anonymity to speak candidly about the discussions, but it is not currently part of the plan. Let me break down the insanity of this line of thinking. Literally, Joe Biden, the President of the United States, has what we would call the high joker. For my spade players, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He has the one card that nobody can defeat. That is called power to leverage. You see, one thing about Republicans is that they understand how to leverage power, even when they do so unethically and illegally. Democrats will beg for power, tell you vote for me, I set you free. Once you give them the power by way of your sacred vote, they get into office and proclaim things like, well, we don't really have the power to do this, or it is not the institutional norm in order to operate in this manner. And then the White House, the advisors are saying, well, if you do this, it may disrupt the already very delicate negotiations that are happening. How? How? The president has the opportunity to walk into the room and say, listen, fellas, I would really appreciate you all working with me in good faith. But if you do not, please understand that by this date and by this time, I will invoke the powers that I can and declare it to be unconstitutional based on the 14th Amendment to ever default on our debt. I would do so. You see, they're not even arguing if it's actually a play that Biden can use. They're really arguing the politics of it, saying it would hurt the economy. It may mess up the credit worthiness of America, it's already messed up. The economy, the economy is really going to be messed up if you stop the federal government from being funded. That jacks up the economy in a way that is completely adversarial to what we're trying to accomplish. And millions of Americans, in addition to being, let's just say, left out of the pie in reference to policy, they will also not get paid for a significant amount of time. The President of the United States is still being an institutionalist here. Good person all around, but if it was a different dynamic, I guarantee you the Republicans would absolutely utilize that option if needed. You have a former president of the United States who actually broke the law. Donald Trump broke the law when he took money from the US military and applied it to build a wall, something it was not budgeted to do. But he did it against the law. We're asking Biden to do something that is well within the law in order to stop millions of Americans from suffering because of the bad faith negotiations of conservatives. And all they are concerned about, Mr. President, is a win for themselves, not a win for the American people, for those who are disenfranchised, for those who actually deserve it and need it. Let's go to a Q&A by Lawrence Tribe, all right? Tribe says the text of the 14th Amendment is explicit. Section four of the 14th Amendment says, quote, the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions, and bounties for services and suppressing insurrection or rebellion should not be questioned. This is a guarantee that the US will always be good for all its debts, period. So the Gazette poses this question. So how can a law passed by Congress in 1917 establishing a debt ceiling decide which debts are valid and should be paid and which are less valid and can be put off. Answer, in my view, a debt ceiling law can't legitimately do that. But there's a catch. 
by leaving that law in place and threatening for the first time ever not to raise the debt ceiling as needed to pay all debts it has already created. Congress can cause economic crisis by pointing to that debt ceiling or to that ceiling and generating panic because nobody can say for sure what would happen when the ceiling is breached. From 1789 to 1917, Congress incurred debts pursuant to statutory authorizations, levying taxes and also borrowing money from time to time. When Congress authorized an individual bond issue, typically for a stated purpose, the Treasury Department could then borrow money pursuant to that authorization. That cumbersome process was replaced in 1917 with a statute generally described as the debt limit or the ceiling, borrowing ceiling. It permits the treasury to issue bonds that would raise revenue that could then be used for any lawful purpose. Up to whatever total Congress had previously specified. The statute's original purpose was to simplify things, not to create a tool that could be used to create uncertainty and chaos. Throughout this process, both before 1917 and up to the present, section four of the 14th amendment has hovered in the background, promising the world that the US could always be counted on to pay its debts in full as long as those debts have been authorized by law. The stakes are so high, they're so high. If there was some level of sentiment of good faith from conservatives on this matter, this is a different conversation. But it is clear there is no good faith negotiation standard. If there is an agreement, that agreement will be so hollow of the policies we need to impact change that we might as well have not even come to the damn table. All right, Benny, thoughts on this? Yeah, in order to fully understand this reality and like this whole debate that's happening right now, I think it's important to emphasize the material reality of how money actually works. Because at the end of the day, the way money works is very simple. The government creates money out of thin air and then creates taxes in order to create demand for the money so that people are forced to use it for everyday transactions and stuff like that. Taxes are not actually meant to pay off the money creation process. It, it by definition is never going to balance out. We're never gonna pay off all of our debts. That's just not how it works. Because once again, the government's just creating money out of thin air. But you create all this ceremony and the circumstance and tradition in order to legitimize that process. Because to a lot of people, that feels like a really ridiculous process. What do you mean? They just create the money out of thin air. There's gotta be some restraints on it. And so that's why they create all of these different like ceremony and circumstance um, and tradition just to give some legitimacy to that core reality of how money does exist. Now, there's a rhetoric point in here that Republicans have really latched onto, which is the idea of the United States having a budget and a country having a budget in general, where if you're sovereign over your currency, your only real budget is the total productive capacity of the economy. But the thing is, if the government has that as their budget, that means they could use the money for things that are actually good and helpful to people. And that's not something that right wingers wanna do. So they create this reality of, oh no, taxes aren't about just creating demand for currency, they're about paying for these government services. You're paying the government for a service. It isn't that we live in a society that's designed to you know, help each other and, and mutually benefit everybody with you know, public infrastructure and stuff like that. No, you're paying for services. And by sort of putting that mentality onto people, you create this idea that working class people need to pay for government services with their taxes. And that the government shouldn't just be willy nilly helping people. No, that only goes to giant corporations. And so that's why this is really a debate right now. Because unfortunately, a lot of these Republicans have drank their own Kool-Aid, not realizing the very simple fact that government spending is quite literally what keeps the entire US economy profitable. Markets cannot exist without the government structure creating the space for markets to exist. If we default on our debts, everything falls apart. The problem is these Republicans who have bought into this idea of a budget, which was really just a propaganda piece to prevent poor people from demanding more from the government. They've drank the Kool-Aid and they're like, what if we do crash the economy? What if we do destroy everything? Because they just don't really know how this actually works. And that is kind of what is terrifying that there's so many people who are elected into office that have unironically drank the Kool-Aid of people like Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. 
So well said, it comes down to indoctrination. They don't even check under the hood. They just accept the talking points as absolute law and constitution, but it is not. That 1917 law is contrary to the constitution of the United States per per amendment 14, section four. All right, we will update obviously as it develops. Okay, racism, racism on clear display. North Carolina lawmaker questions his colleagues, um, let's just say Harvard matriculation based on either his race or perhaps his athleticism. Here it is. Representative Jones, I wanna ask you the question is, I understand that you went into public school and you went to Harvard and Harvard Law. And the question I guess is, uh, would you have been able to maybe achieve this if you were not an athlete or a minority? I'm hoping I wasn't the only one that got shocked by that comment that the only reason you went to Harvard is because you were black and an athlete. I did not say that. I said, would that, did that end up being one of the reasons? I do not know that. I asked him this. I'm just going to say one thing. Harvard had five rankings for their students. One, two, three, four, five. And when I graduated from Harvard, I was in rank two. So I earned my place and I did well. It's so sad, a respected lawmaker who worked very hard, went to Harvard and then Harvard Law, that he would have to even justify, even justify that moment, dignify that moment with an actual answer. Let's put it up full mass. Now, the white North Carolina lawmaker who posed this question to his black colleague has now apologized. So let me give you context. Representative Jeff McNeely, a Stony Point Republican and a member of the ultra conservative Freedom Caucus, interrupted Raleigh based Democrat, Representative Abe Jones. In this interruption, amid a discussion about an education bill, that would extend the requirements for North Carolina opportunity scholarships. So he interrupts this conversation, this good faith conversations about making sure more have access, more young people have access to money for college. He decides to say, well, hey, listen, what about you? Did you go to Harvard and Harvard Law because of your skin color or perhaps your ability to play ball? It's an insane question. But the individual posing the question is in that moment at least unaware of how racist that question is, perhaps. It's called implicit bias or unconscious bias. But see, they are willfully unconscious to it. You see, willful ignorance bears no bliss. They are in that position because they choose to be, okay? Now here's the apology, Uh, the apology says, McNeely kept his word and personally apologized to Jones uh, before the meeting ended, alleging lawmakers misinterpreted his words. Jones accepted McNeely's apology. I I assume he didn't mean any harm to me. He said, all right, um, dear brother, you are a better man than me because I guarantee you uh, that individual has said absolutely worse about you behind closed doors. What he said on the microphone was, a measured permeation of his internal bias against you. Because what does it actually say? It says that he's walking around believing that the black man who is an elected representative, graduated from Harvard Law, somehow did not earn that position, somehow did not acquire that status, that academic opportunity and that academic status based on his own intellect or volition, that in order For you as a black male, sir, to obtain that level of education, it must be because of something else other than your mind. That is what he believes. That is what he basically said. You see, if he had a Harvard law education, which by the way, he does not. He would not expect someone to believe he received that education because of his athleticism or skin color. He would say, I earned that education by way of working hard. He would expect people to treat him that way, not the way he treated you, representative. All right, apology, not even real in my humble opinion.
Ben, any thoughts on this? Most definitely. So this is one of the things that right wingers love to do is they love to completely invert any type of situation, right? So in this case, this is pretending as though black and brown folks have an advantage when it comes into getting into Harvard. When in actuality, if you look at the numbers, it's pretty pretty clear that legacy admissions are the pretty big chunk of people that are going to any Ivy League university. Those are gonna be the bulk of people. And lo and behold, it's disproportionately white because, you know, I very shocker. The United States has a long history of racism, especially in Ivy League universities. And so, of course, Incredibly rich, privileged white folks are overrepresented in the top tier universities across the country because, of course, rich white families like keeping wealth and power within the family. Oh my goodness, this is, we're all learning something today. Um, but right wingers like to pretend it's the opposite. They like to pretend that, oh, you know, because there's one small affirmative action program that they put in place that, oh, must mean that by definition, you know, uh, this is the only reason, you know, anybody gets into college and, oh, you know, poor white folks are so oppressed, having a difficult time getting into college. When the harsh reality is, the opposite is true, right? It's not that black and brown folks have an advantage getting into college. Right, it's actually the opposite, and that's why those programs exist. And they do the same thing with trans people too. They pretend that all oh, trans people are all these like rich, powerful celebrities that have convinced huge chunks of the media to support our existence. Right, when in reality, of course, we all know that trans people make something like less than half of what the average person does. But at the end of the day, it really demonstrates the extreme bigotry that these people have because what they are not saying, what goes unsaid within that statement, is the assumption. Right, is the assumption that black and brown folks are incapable of getting into Harvard. And thus the only reason that there would be anybody going to Harvard then is because of an affirmative action program. And that is what this is left unsaid anytime you see a right winger say this. And it's the same is true for marginalized people of any stripe that if they say, oh, you must be an affirmative action hire, they are implying that the only people that could ever have the qualifications, that could ever have the skills to have any type of position are cisgender heterosexual white men. Given how well the representative performed at Harvard, it goes to the point I make often. Black communities do not have a lack of talent. We typically have a lack of resources. And because of those resources not being as readily available, it is contextualized or at least it produces this inequity as it relates to higher education in particular and the zip code that you're born in. Your zip code should never determine your opportunity for success. And that is what we're trying to fight every day. We got more. All right, hell of a thing. A college is being sued. It's being sued because an athlete with Down syndrome is upset about the discrimination. And so are we. Here's some of the video. Hayden Cox, all right, let's put up the picture for a mask. Was full of school spirit. Viral star Caden Cox is now suing the university where he once made history. And he's suing them for virulent abuse. Mr. Cox is now 23, burst onto the national sports scene. If you remember fall of 2021, after kicking a third quarter field goal and went on to kick three more that season, earning a feature on ESPN. He says he was traumatized by a campus supervisor who used slurs about people with disabilities and threatened him with a knife. Mr. Cox also worked while attending Hawking College, a community college in Nelsonville, Ohio, where the suit alleges he was harassed and assaulted by his boss. His supervisor, Matthew Mosco, is among the defendants named in the suit. Along with Betty Young, the school president, the board of trustees, and five unnamed college employees. Now, here's the supervisor and school president together, all right? There they are. Basically, Buck stops with them. 
But then there is a governing authority of any college, board of trustees, here they are, okay? All right, so Matthew used the R word and other derogatory language around Cox and yelled and berated him in front of other employees, the suit alleges. Adding that he also requested Cox for hugs and looked through his phone without permission. The lawsuit also detailed harassment complaints made by three other student employees about Matthew Moscow, who it said was hired directly by the college president, Betty Young, as a favor to a board of trustee member and without a customary background check. That background check would have revealed domestic violence charges from 2010 through 2016 in the state of Florida. As a result of the complaint, the lawsuit alleges that Young retaliated against Cox by removing him as the recipient of two graduation awards he had been selected to receive. Cox's name appears in a digital version of the graduation program, but his name was removed from the print version. He ultimately did not receive the awards according to the lawsuit. Now, there are a lot of allegations in this lawsuit, a whole lot. And it is absolutely on the institution to respond in kind. But I will say this, based on the allegations, I'm absolutely shocked. That all of this, and I'm talking about from the lack of a background check to hiring somebody based on a favor from the board of trustees, if this is true. I'm shocked that at the end of that, somebody would allow a person to discriminate against an individual who has so much spirit, heart, and love. So at this point, these allegations. We're waiting to see how the university responds and who actually says what. But at this stage of the game, I'm siding with my man here, Mr. Cox. All right, any thoughts? Yeah, unfortunately, this is something that is incredibly easy to believe because there's one thing that our society does with anybody who has any type of disability in one way, shape, or form, which is like strip away agency, right? There's even a lot of well meaning people will do this, right? Well, they'll, they'll like come in with pity and say, oh, yeah, I feel bad for you, this, that, and the other thing. But do so in a way that fundamentally strips agency away mm-hmm. from individuals. And it's part of like a, this larger problem that exists within our society where you know anybody who's not incredibly privileged and white and fully abled and things like this uh, is gonna get actively dehumanized in some way because that's the way our culture unfortunately is. And when you have your agency stripped away like that, we also culturally enable abusive people to then find those people uh, who are being alienated and stripped of agency in some way, shape or form. And unfortunately, our society lets people commit harm to them with great regularity, right? This, uh, the person accused of this was also accused of domestic violence and that perfectly tracks with the type of pattern of behavior would expect to see from somebody like that. And unfortunately, it's something that our society doesn't do a very good job dealing with because especially when you're stripping agency away from somebody, when then they later come in and say, hey, this was done to me. There's all this doubt and disbelief that happens. People always mm-hmm. pretend like, oh, you know, I, I couldn't imagine this possibly happening. Uh, when it happens literally all the time. It's just that because we are just casting people aside and not taking them super seriously, um, people are just more willing to disregard their claims of you know dealing with this type of thing. Yeah, well, we take Mr. Cox and his claim very seriously, and we will follow the case as it develops and wait on an appropriate response. We have more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. Got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday. You're gonna feel free, back off. I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. What do you Excuse want? Me. Yes. Roll down, please. I'm not rolling. Who the hell are you? Sir, this you? is private property. This sure, is I'm a private lane mechanic. Lane. So what? Sir, hey, hey, Sir, hey, hey. Listen to me. This is. A, do you have a permit to be here? It's none of your damn business. Okay, sir. We pay a lot. Step away from my car, sir. Step away from my car. 
My American tax dollars pay for this permit. This is a private lake. Y'all don't look like you're supposed to be here. I'm more American like you. You look like European. Where do you come from? Boland? Sir, roll down this You window. come from Boland or no, Russia? No, I'm about to call the police. My, my tax you is more than your whole salary. Here. Get out sir. of here. Sir. No, don't stare at me. Sir. Hey, hey, don't you dare oh. touch my car. Oh, my God. Babe, you just go, just go, just go, just go, just go. Don't you dare. You're lucky I got my... Oh, my God, he hit me. You khanziri. Ya Khanziri, you're calling the police, you say I hit you? As I have said many times, Karens are dangerous. She approaches this person, this individual inside of a vehicle because of what? Because according to her, they don't look like they belong, okay? They don't look like they're supposed to be there. And her American tax dollars grants her the authority to go and basically demand freedom papers from other individuals. She believes simply look as if they should not be there. And then when she realizes she's up against an anti carry okay? He's not having it. He's not answering questions. He's telling her to leave. He's not providing any level of response to dignify the obvious bias of approaching someone and saying, you just don't look the part to be part on this property, okay? And then what do we see? Clearly in the video, she says, ah, you hit me. What, is he the flash? I mean, because if he hit you, madam, I mean, that, that had to be one of the fastest physical assaults we've ever seen on the planet. Naturally, there was no physical assault. This is why we cover these stories. And this is why it's important. It is important because a lot of people, a lot of people will be able to see that these things actually do happen. Believe me, there was a time. When virtually everyone would believe whatever the Karen said. And if she said, this person physically assaulted me. And then I called the police and the police came and I told the police what happened. That's why he was arrested. That has happened many times before. But now we have video evidence showing contrary to that narrative. We have the video evidence of an individual claiming something happened when it did not, threatening to call the police. And likely she did based on what we saw. It helps others understand the context that's important. That individuals will utilize their perceived and actual privilege in order to affect a dynamic that's contrary to the truth. So we provide a mirror, a reflection, if you would. Benny. Hell of a thing here. Now this should have been an anti-Karen moment, but the Karenicity was so extreme, we had to still label it, categorize it as a Karen. Thoughts? Yeah, and I think this was like the archetypal Karen right here in this moment, right? Because she really hit all the high notes. It's like she was following a script, starting off with, hey, um, <laughs> you don't look like you belong here, escalating to her invading their space, right? Her like hitting their car, and then her at the end being like, oh, you hit me, you hit me, right? I mean, quite literally, it's just this like standard script that unfortunately a lot of people in our society know and feel entitled to use against anybody that they don't like. And fundamentally, it's just so infuriating, but there's also this layer of this hall monitor mentality of like, you know, it's it's kind of like the next door mindset of like, I need to be constantly monitoring everything, every single one of my neighbors are doing literally all the time and enforcing rules that are not my business to enforce and things that shouldn't be rules in the first place in a lot of times. And it is just speaks to like honestly this pathetic nature of like really is your life that uninteresting that your only like thing occupying your brain is harassing the other people around you maybe chill maybe get a life i don't know it is quite ridiculous now this could be a skit all right this could be a back and forth but all of it is based on actual dynamics that we have seen occur time and time again all right we'll keep you updated on that
I got something for you though. Double dose. You wanna call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're gonna feel free! Back off! I'm gonna tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Help! My friend's friend who got into an accident in California received racist remarks and was physically abused by the other driver. Insurance. You're refusing? Are you refusing? Where is your where is your insurance? You hit my car. I don't give a about this. You hit my car. So where is your insurance? Where is your insurance? Do you have a driver's license? Are you from America? Do you even have papers? Are you legal to be here? Where is your driver's license? Because I'm asking you. You hit my car. That's definitely gonna be a problem. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Uh oh, uh oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh wow. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely gonna be an issue. Dang. <laughs> wow. Now, this is one of those situations where possibly. The Karen in question was in the right as it relates to the accident, okay? Let's just say for the sake of argument. But the overreaction and then the physical violence that permeated from the moment of the fender bender is the reason we're highlighting this story. I want you to imagine if the male or the or black male would have engaged in such behavior. I mean, come on, going around, slapping a license out of a person's hand, physically assaulting others around the scene, multiple cameras are recording it. And the gentleman who she pushed on the ground was almost hit by a car. He could have been seriously injured or died because of the temper tantrum of the Karen. Karenicity runs deep in this one, obviously. Uh, we highlight these things to make sure there's uh, opportunity for reflection. Let's put it up full mass. This was an interesting moment right here, okay? Because when he showed the license or the ID, whatever it may be, um, instead of understanding, well, this is the moment you have been actually demanding, madam. You wanted to see the license. You said some things that were. Derogatory, obviously. You know, yes, I do believe the person is able to understand exactly what you're asking for. But why get physical? It's not required. It is an overreaction. Now, Benny, uh, I think everyone who has lived a little bit, we've all been involved in some level of car accident, right? Even if we were riding with somebody, uh, there has to be a civility in how you deal with that moment. You cannot get out the car and all of a sudden, you know, want to physically assault those. Who are standing around you, or maybe uh, even the one who uh, caused the accident. It's not uh, the place, nor is it appropriate. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, most definitely. Like anytime there's a car accident, which is just going to happen because that's life, you know, the response is to just sort of relax, figure out whose fault it was, let the insurance deal with it, you know, and hopefully everybody gets home safe. That's really the goal uh, at that point. But one of the things that she said, I really want to harp on because she kept asking it if, oh, you know, are you legal to be here and stuff like that. Right. And that actually speaks to something that is really, I, I think, menacing about our society because people don't recognize how truly violent of a society the United States is. Because so long as it's institutions or systems that are, you know, committing acts of violence, then people tend to pretend like it's not violence. They tend to act like deporting people isn't violence, that like calling the police on people, you know, isn't violence. When in actuality, it is, right? Correct. If you're literally threatening somebody with ice, you are threatening them with violent action. You are just claiming that you're not being violent in that moment because it's the system, it's the institution doing it. And so fundamentally, it just speaks to this, I think, like underlying evil that exists within the United States. That is the fact that our systems are so willing to dehumanize people and commit violence against people. It's just when it's done with a badge, then all of a sudden it's seen as legitimate. Very well said, we got more on the other side. 
It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Okay, let me uh, remind everyone, um, memberships starting at four ninety nine. Um, we would love for you to be part of the impact here at TYT. All right, the membership helps us make positive impact and get the uncorrupted representation we deserve, not only in media, but also in government. TYT is committed to making positive change with you. TYT.com forward slash impact. Okay, Twitch, Chris Huggy literally asking for their papers. Yeah, all right, what if I told you allegedly New York police officers stood by and allowed a woman to be stabbed many, many times. Let's put up the picture, very sad. Christina Lee was stalked by a stranger murdered in her apartment in 2022. Now a lawsuit details how police spoke to her killer through the door, but did nothing to help. Lee's body was found inside and a summit Nash 25 was found hiding under a mattress. He was charged with murder. Okay, Nash snuck in behind her as she entered her Christie Street building around 420 AM. We have the screenshots. This was on February 13th, 2022. Neighbors heard her cries for help for at least five minutes as she was being viciously butchered and dialed 911. Two unidentified officers from the 5th Precinct about three blocks away responded to the 911 call in four minutes. They heard Miss Lee screaming for help, according to the Manhattan Supreme Court filing against the city and the cops. Despite having reason to believe that Miss Lee's life was in imminent danger, the officers failed to gain entry to Miss Lee's apartment or otherwise provide her with any potentially life saving police or medical assistance until Miss Lee had been stabbed more than 40 times. They even spoke to her alleged killer through the closed door of Miss Lee's apartment. It took additional officers more than an hour to arrive. The officers identities have not been released until they are. There is the responsible New York City police leadership, Commissioner Soul, Chief of Patrol John Chell and Chief Training, Chief of Training Juanita Holmes. The family has nearly reached their GoFundMe goal. This is the GoFundMe for them. The GoFundMe was promoted by Lee's family who dedicated the funds to women's rights, a cause that Lee supported. Funds went to support organizations such as Planned Parenthood, Womankind, Safe Walks, which seeks to protect women commuting in New York neighborhood. And we support those organizations as well. Please give if you can. So what happened here? I thought the police like running into apartments. I thought they like kicking in doors. Hmm? I thought they would run into the danger. You mean to tell me screaming is happening? Now remember the screaming was happening before the cops arrived. Now when one gets a call, the operator hears the proclamation of the neighbor. They're screaming, obviously there's violence. We need the police, it's been happening for about five minutes or more. Police come in four minutes, so now you have at least nine minutes, at least nine minutes of a murder. Nine minutes in, the police get there, they talk to the killer through the door, they hear the screamings, they do nothing, they hear the shouts, they do nothing. They hear the calls for help, they do not enter. They do not forcibly enter. See, now you have all of the probable cause you need to do whatever in order to save the life of the person in danger. Remember those two elements, either you believe that your life as an officer is in imminent danger or somebody else's. Remember that part or someone else's life 
is in imminent danger, you can now take action. This is why you are paid. This is why we give you a gun and you get an oath and you get the opportunity to be a hero. But they waited for an hour according to the official filing before they entered. By that time, you got over 40 stab wounds. You have a dead Miss Lee and you have an alleged killer who's hiding under a mattress. Why did they wait this long? I got questions. The police are supposed to be at their best in this moment, right? This is the moment where we should be talking about how they saved the life of Miss Lee. But that's not the conversation today. And as long as they continue to hide the identity of those who have been accused of not doing their job, and as long as we have court rulings that justify cops not doing their job, saying that they are not constitutionally mandated to protect or legally mandated to protect, we will have this problem. Unequal application, not only of the law, but also of protection. Any thoughts? Yeah, this is a really harsh and sad reminder of the simple fact that policing in the United States is fundamentally an institution of cowardice. It is an institution of fear and cowardice. That is why I think policing exists in the way it does in the United States. And it's why police behave the way that they do. Fundamentally, for example, police officers will actively target homeless people, despite the fact that homeless people are far more likely to be the victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime, right? And then that's why you see police officers regularly victimizing innocent people while also treating literal murderers with kid gloves, especially if they're a white supremacist that has committed some sort of mass shooting. Somehow they tend to get apprehended quite peacefully very often. And you realize that at the core of this is really just the fear, right? Police officers are funded and fueled by the fear and paranoia of privileged people in the suburbs who want to use violence as a way to bother the people that they don't like so that they can feel less afraid. And unfortunately, that doesn't actually mean helping people who are in danger. All it really means is concentrating danger into spaces where privileged people are less likely to see it and experience it. That's right, this is the reason I'm happy this lawsuit is going forward because it allows for exposure. It may even allow for a deposition or two, so you get things on the record you normally would not. So we will see how this develops. It is an ironic lawsuit, but I think a necessary lawsuit to say the least. Prison guard, prison guard has been accused of sleeping with multiple individuals incarcerated. Let's put it up, prison warden actually. Very interesting. Prison warden Sarah Jane Williams, 38 years of age, allegedly had relationships with three inmates, incarcerated individuals in the UK, facing three counts of misconduct in public office and causing a computer to perform a function to secure unauthorized access to data or program, according to the Daily Mail UK. The alleged offenses took place at HMP Alt Course in Liverpool. The misconduct charges allege she had relationships with uh, with several prisoners. Um, you had Elias Morgan, 33. That's the one we actually have a picture of. Allegations also include she had a relationship with Mr. Connor Crawford, 32 years of age, and Mr. Craig Stinson, 32 years of age. We do not have their pictures. Each of the three counts alleged that she communicated with the prisoners via her personal mobile phone and failed to inform prison authorities that she knew they were in unlawful possession of a mobile device or mobile phone. It is also claimed that she divulged sensitive information to one individual regarding another prisoner's location. Williams of Watness Cheshire appeared at Liverpool Magistrates Court where Andrew Page prosecuting asked the bench to send the case to the Crown Court. The magistrates granted Williams unconditional bail to appear at the higher court on June 13th. Now, let me tell you why this is really, really dangerous. Now, the relationship aspect, that's one dimension of this, is actually what comes out of that. And you heard a little bit of it in the reporting from the Daily Mail UK. And the part you heard that's really the linchpin of why this is so imperative to stop is the part that says, She shared information on another incarcerated person's location. Well, that becomes a security risk. Let me put it this way. If you happen to be serving time inside of this facility, 
and you get into an argument with the warden's boyfriend. What do you think is going to possibly happen to you? That warden has complete control over that facility. From the guards to administrative policy, healthcare, and naturally, obviously, the individuals who are serving time. But that becomes a danger in itself. That becomes a danger in itself. And that's the reason these relationships are not only prohibited ethically, they are statutorily illegal because of the violence and sometimes security issues that come from the relationship. We will follow the story as it develops. Obviously, right now, it is still pending. Benny, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the real frustrating, like structural problems that exist within prisons because fundamentally, this is something that Unfortunately, it happens with great regularity, especially in American prisons. Now, obviously, this story was from the UK, but in American prisons, my understanding is that this situation is actually even worse, right? right. Where there's a lot of rampant sexual assault that happens in prisons in the United States, not just from other inmates, but also from staff as well. And in fact, like if we're speaking to the material reality of prisons, right? Not what is on the books in terms of policy, but what in terms of actually what happens in prisons. Functionally, sexual assault is used as a regular form of torture in the United States, in our prisons. That fundamentally, that is a core element of prisons within the US. And it just really speaks to the shamelessness and the willingness to just fundamentally dehumanize people and the gratuitous violence that exists within any prison system. And so, like there being a sort of relationship between a warden and inmates. I think in my opinion, that's gonna be sexual assault regardless. But if you add a layer of impropriety in terms of like giving them extra privileges, it becomes a whole nother can of worms. The US Senator, Senator John Ossoff in America launched an investigation into prisons. You can find that online. It is striking the detail about sexual abuse that happens in prisons all across America. He has it documented, it is detailed, has led to the indictment of a few individuals already. I expect it to lead to more indictments and those indictments include wardens, all right? We got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. There's a story that we reported on last week, the story has already been updated. Um, the updated version is still available and the original reporting was taken down. I wanna provide context and a direct examination as well as provide an apology. Let me put up the picture full mass. Last week, 35 million individuals viewed a video, it was viral. This video showed a woman screaming help and black males around her disputing about about a bike. Well, in that there were two narratives. One narrative was to believe the young people. The other narrative was to believe the adult. In that instance, I believed the young person. I still believe that there's a good faith reason why both possibly believed that they actually had access to that bike. At no point did I ever believe that the young black male was trying to rob the female in question. But now it has been reported that there's a receipt showing she had a good faith reason to believe that the city bike was hers. Naturally, that information has not been rebutted nor confirmed at all by the others involved, we're still waiting for an update. Also, City Bike has not confirmed, at least at this point, how this could have happened where two individuals possibly believed that they both rented that same bike at the same time. Over 35 million views, well over 100 publications covered it, and there were two narratives. My advocacy, my advocacy was connected to their youth, not their race. There was also a statement from the hospital that called the incident disturbing. I want everyone to know that my advocacy was not in bad faith. It doesn't mean that it wasn't wrong. It doesn't mean that the youth operated in bad faith either. Possibly there's an explanation why both believed 
they were in fact entitled to that particular bike. I say that to highlight a reality here, okay? I'm a zealous advocate. I've always been a zealous advocate, will continue to be so. But I'm not Fox News. When I'm presented with evidence that shows, well, at least contrary to the overall conclusion, that somehow she knew she did not have access to that bike. Well, that's not true if the receipts are real. She believed she had access to the bike. So for that matter, to the woman who was in the middle of this, I submit to you my apologies as a man. Now, I do not like the fact that you screamed help me when you were not being robbed. I still have an issue with that. I don't like the people who are saying all over social media that these young black men were trying to rob the woman in that moment. I do not believe that's what happened, still don't believe that's what was happening. I believe that they both believed that they had access to that city bike. And until we have additional information, we're up, that's where it's at now. But I wanna make it very clear, what we do here is opinion commentary, sometimes that opinion can be incorrect, but it doesn't mean it was developed nor presented in bad faith. And when there's a moment like this, I can't speak for everybody else, I can speak for me. When there's a moment like this, I will always look into this camera and let you know specifically that I am sorry for getting it wrong because I give a damn about getting it right. And so ma'am, once again, I apologize and I concur with your attorney, who by the way, I don't think the attorney believes based on his own wording that the young men were involved in a robbery as it has been presented or suggested on social media. A New York City hospital, New York City hospital worker was caught on a viral video quarreling with a group of young black men over a city bike, is now receiving threats to her and her family. The woman's lawyer said Friday, Sarah Comrie, a physician's assistant at Bellevue Hospital came, became a target of an internet irie over the last week when footage of her arguing over one of the popular bike rentals was shared over and over again on social media. Her lawyer, Justin Marino, said there is much more to the story than what the video depicts. I am trying to stop the threats to her family and to her by clearing her name and letting people know what actually occurred, Marino said. Civil rights lawyer Ben Crump, according to the Daily News, Ben Crump posted on social media that Comrie tried to weaponize her tears to paint this man as a threat, but appears to have taken the post down. Marino, the attorney said Comrie was, uh, has two main goals at this point. One, she wants her job, and two, she wants to walk the streets safely. Marino said he has warned the hospital and the Health Plus Hospitals Corporation that he will stand up for Comrie's rights. Companies are permitted to do investigations when they see a concern. He said, I will have an issue with them if and when they move to terminate her. A spokesperson from the hospital declined to address Marino's specific concerns, but a statement posted by the agency on Twitter earlier this week called the video of Comrie disturbing. The provider is currently out on leave and will remain on leave pending a review. Uh, The uh, statement says, as a health system, we are committed to providing an environment for our patients and staff that is free from discrimination of any kind. Marina also says that he and Comrie have receipts to prove that she did in fact pay for the city bike in question. Once again, as I have said, um, if that's true, and I have no reason to believe it's not, okay? That means that she did have a good faith effort to believe that the bike was hers in that moment. As I've also said, it doesn't mean that the young men were trying to rob her. They also could have had a good faith effort to believe that no, the bike was actually theirs in that moment, okay? I would like to see this fully resolved, but I also wanna remind everyone, wanna remind everyone that we do very important work at Indisputable and it will not stop. Do you remember Mr. Vaughn? This is the kind of work we care deeply about as well. You see, nobody would cover that story See, Mr. Vaughn was about to die inside of a prison in Alabama. The individuals incarcerated with Mr. Vaughn, they were aware of the plan. 
So they snuck in a cell phone, took pictures of Mr. Bond and sent it out to the free world. Nobody covered it because they did not believe these pictures. Well, I went to Alabama. I saw the pictures, contacted the sister, and I went to Alabama. Mr. Bond is alive and Mr. Bond is now receiving medical treatment at another facility and Mr. Bond looks good today. We have covered countless stories. We'll continue to do so regardless of race, regardless of your background, sexual orientation, we don't care. We advocate for those who have been historically marginalized. And that is the important work that all of us must engage in. So once again, I submit to you my apologies as well. And once again, my apologies to Ms. Comrie, at least we know that you had a good faith reason to believe you had access to that rented bike. But I see the comments also about screaming help. I understand that. I do believe that was a much, a little much. But once again, the conclusion that you did not have access to it, I completely, completely, I wanna make this clear. I completely changed my conclusion that you had no access nor did you believe you did, all right? Okay, I hope that settles it. I did it last week, we took it down. Um, and this is my update for Monday. We will see if th- this story develops any further. Okay, Ben, thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, situations like that can obviously be really complicated, tech issues and whatnot. Um, I think, yeah, screaming help is probably a little bit much, right? But like, <laughs> um, you know, tensions are really high right now. Tensions yeah. are really high right now. And I think there's a lot of like sort of like retail conflict that turns into these big blow ups. And like ultimately, I think fundamentally, it just speaks to our need as a society to approach small conflicts like this with a little bit more patience, understanding, and assumption of good faith. Well said. Very well said. Benny, always a pleasure, my friend. Have you on the show. Tell people they can follow you, check out your great work. Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Benjamin Carollo, on Blue Sky at Benny, or of course on the breakdown. uh, That's at TYT Breakdown, where I put out videos all the time of some super awesome content. Always, always great, my friend. Until next time. All right. The bullpen is next. Stick and stay. All right, let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. Orlando Sanchez, founder of Texas Latino Conservatives, former Harris County, Texas treasurer, 2007 to 2018. GOP strategist, US Air Force veteran, thank you for your service. Thank you for being on the program, how are you? Good, delighted to be here, thank you for the invitation. Glad to have you. We are going to chop it up about the seemingly programmatic model to eliminate diversity inside of the GOP, specifically discussing diversity related to black people, to brown folk, to uh, to women. And I have some direct cases to cite. I don't know what you know or believe about that sentiment of decreasing diversity in the GOP. So if you would share your thoughts and I would then opine. Well, uh, if in fact that is what's going on in certain portions of the country, that's tragic. Um, America is very diverse. Uh, We've always thrived on our diversity. I think we all benefit from our diversity. And uh, I, for one, uh, as the head of the Texas Latino Conservatives, obviously by the nature of my organization, we're trying to increase diversity. And uh, I firmly believe it's a good thing here in Texas. We believe it's a good thing and I would be very disappointed if uh, 49 of our other states across the country don't believe it's a good thing. All right, well, let me tell you one state who doesn't. Uh, Let me take you to Kansas. So Kansas, they are promoting, the Republican Party, they're promoting to get rid of their diversity um, caucuses basically inside of the Republican Party. And these are specialized groups, as you are well aware, to advocate for particular communities within the GOP so that there's a sensitivity to their issues because parties or political systems are meant to advocate policies and issues, etc. And so the Kansas GOP, they have literally introduced a measure that is backed by the chairman of the GOP 
that would eliminate all diversity groups, including black, Latino, women, and youth. Not the only state, but it is the state that has concurrence from the executive leader. What say you about that type of motion inside of the GOP in Kansas? Well, I'll tell you, I've been in the Republican Party for many, many years, I guess since after high school, and I'm a rather old man. Uh, but at one point, I remember Lee Atwater used to say the GOP, the grand old party, is the party of the Big Ten. We want ideas. We are not all going to agree on everything, but uh, it is important that diverse communities have a voice, that their interests be uh, shared. And I understand that many executive committees want uh, only members of the executive committee in the different counties, uh, at least that's how the GOP is structured, or that the state Republican executive committee actually work on the platform. But to have different caucuses, whether it's Hispanics and African Americans, Asian Americans, whatever it may be, Indo Americans, uh, participate in the process, I can't see any harm. You know, I get that point. I get it, brother. You. You're correct on the sentiment. I think it actually does your party good to have these collective voices being able to express a diverse background and say these are the policies we care deeply about. However, the GOP seems to be on a mission. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about within the party ranks itself. I'm talking about even among the political class, such as the 25 states that have either passed or are seriously considering passing laws to get rid of diversity. Uh, inclusion and equity, uh, inclusion inside of workplaces, trainings, and even state owned colleges. I think these are problems. I don't think these dynamics will lead you to a solution. I think one, it contributes to the decline of racial minorities inside of the GOP. And it also creates a clear contrast between uh, the progress of these communities and what the GOP is willing to value in their proclamation and promotion of these communities. What say you? Well, you know, for years the Republican Party, and I agree with this, has been the party that rewards uh, uh, it's a meritocracy. I mean, if you're good uh, and you have a you know a good academic track record, you get into our university. We certainly don't support discrimination. What we don't want is the government setting quotas and deciding who's in and who's not. I can tell you as a former member of the Houston City Council, which the city of Houston in Texas is very diverse. I served under an African American mayor as well as a Caucasian mayor. But I argued vehemently against affirmative action and here's why. Affirmative action in our city was a carve out for only 20, 25% of the work. And unfortunately, what we're seeing nowadays is that our ethnic minorities, which are now a majority of the city of Houston, because the Caucasians aren't the majority now, it's African Americans and Hispanics, but their portion of the contracts is carved out to 25%. So I always say, don't limit yourself, don't let government set quotas. It can work both ways. I think we should look at people based on the merits of their abilities and certainly without any inkling of discrimination and choose the very best. Because you had that position, you know more than most that you don't really have an issue of talent in particular communities. You have an issue of resources. There's not a lack of talent, there's a lack of resources. And so if the government fails to prioritize resources in order to ensure straight competition, then that means you have to correct that model on the back end. And you have to basically reverse engineer to get to the solution overall, the remedy that we're looking for. When you start simply eliminating the very diversity programs that are meant to alert an individual to the reality of discrimination or discriminatory tactics inside of a workplace or even in college education. When you eliminate those avenues for absolute understanding or at least a level of awareness, do you think the problem gets better, dear sir, by osmosis or does it get worse? Well, let me just tell you, I think that in your and you're correct. There was a point at where we had to reverse engineer and give opportunities to, to folks and I completely understand. But there comes a time again where you don't want government dictating what those numbers are. Uh, and I, I fully understand. I mean, I drive the city of Houston, for example. I have to refer, you know, we talk a lot about food deserts. It's true. Mm -hmm. 
There are portions of our community that have very low income with high diabetes rates because there are no healthy foods. And people say, well, why can't folks get healthy foods? Well, one, they don't have transportation. Who wants to ride Metro, the public transit system for two hours and carry groceries? Uh, It's just not convenient. I do understand that. But what we don't want is government deciding everything for us. And there comes a point. I mean, you look at the University of Houston, one of the largest public universities in the state of Texas, probably just very diverse. Uh, you know, yeah. African American students, Hispanic students, Asian students, you know, government needs to get out of it. You know, you say government, you don't want government deciding everything, but you all okay with government deciding what a woman should do with her body. You're okay with the government deciding. Um, how individuals can express their religious beliefs, even if they work in government and those religious beliefs are discriminatory discriminatory against protected classes. In those cases, you all like the government being involved. However, when it comes to making sure that everyone has a fair opportunity in this country, all of a sudden the conversation becomes, we don't want the government involved in that. And let me read to you a quote from um, Antonio Ingram, um, the assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, this is about discrimination against people who have just begun to get access to these spaces. That was echoed by the uh, Latino leader who's in charge of the Latino caucus in Kansas as well. So you have individuals inside of the Republican Party who disagree with you just on sentiment. Uh, and I wanna know what your response is to that. Government is involved in these other areas, but all of a sudden government should not be involved here. Yeah, I know we get involved in this uh, issue of uh, abortion. Let me just say from the abortion perspective, and I'm just speaking from my perspective. First of all, very tough issue, but when it comes to a human life, a beating heart, uh, I think there's you know clear distinctions on both sides. I always come down on the side of a human being, regardless of their race or ethnicity or, or religion and nationality. I mean, a beating heart is a beating heart, and that's what I'm gonna say about that. I'm, just, I'm sure this isn't gonna go into it discussion about abortion. Uh, I will say with respect to the GOP, uh, and and even I have said that the GOP and members of my party, we really need to get out of our comfort zone and start working communities of diversity. There's nothing wrong with going into a predominantly African American community, Hispanic community, the barrio or Chinatown and talk to people about conservative values. That's how you grow the party. We haven't done an effective job. On the other hand, We don't have a lot of African Americans, Hispanics and Asians running to be uh, precinct chairs throughout the country who then become the members of the executive committee who make policy. And remember, let me just say, uh, this isn't only uh, the Republican party. I remember 1964 when the freedom freedom movement in Mississippi tried to get seated in New Jersey. Uh, The credentials committee wouldn't seat African Americans who were duly elected. So both parties have a history of this and we as Americans need to work hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So on the latter part, I definitely agree, but I do find it uh, honestly, all due respect, laughable. That when I'm talking about the current racism of the GOP, you all will go back to the 1960s to find a democratic version of the current GOP version. What's the problem? I was born in 1981, sir, Uh, which means that what happened in 1960, those individuals were racist, I don't give a damn what party they belong to. And to compare what happened in the 1960s as a way to contrast what's happening today in the GOP, I think is an illegitimate argument. Do you not agree? No, I disagree. I mean, I think as a, as a as an immigrant to this country who didn't even speak the language when I arrived here, uh, I'm a member of the GOP. We have a very diverse party here in Texas mm-hmm. and in my county in Harris County. Uh, we can cherry pick certain incidences like Kansas or maybe a piece of legislation that some legislator in Florida introduced, but in general, the party okay. does uh, value diversity. I know right. I do, and I'm. Mm. I, we're working hard to increase diversity. So I, right. I don't agree. That's the general sentiment. All right. Well, listen. I appreciate you being on the show. Enjoyed uh, it. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I will say this to your statement about you all working for diversity. Either that's a lie, um, or you are more hopeful uh, than the rest, because 25 states passing laws against diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as multiple. Uh, state GOPs saying that these particular diversity caucuses are no longer necessary. That is more than anyone cherry picking that is called a movement, sir. And I hope that you stand against it. I do, and we're all about hope and opportunity and a prosperous future. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time. You bet. All right.
Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.